because we have a new and a sort of new panelist joining us, I thought we would hear a little bit first from Francesca just about what she's working on um, and how that ties into the context of new economy and collaboration in particular. Okay, thank you, thank you, Sylvia. Um, so, uh, I have a couple different hats, actually, uh, that bring me to this topic. So, um, there's several different uh, organizations that I'm part of, within which I've been exploring things around new ways of working, new types of governance models, how we can collaborate together more, um, and also the role of leadership and distributed leadership within organizations. So, um, my core uh, hat for the last five years has been WeShare. So WeShare is a global network, and um, I would call it a collective of freelancers. So there's many different ways of describing WeShare because it's a very emergent type of organization. It's distributed across the world. We have members in many different countries. We also have a very big festival called WeShare Fest that we're holding um, for the fifth time in Paris in July. Um, we also have it in Barcelona. So you're also all invited to continue the conversation that we're having here at those places. But so what's really interesting in WeShare is that we actually discovered um, probably about a few years ago that what we really were doing was experimenting with new ways of working and we were really using our community as a laboratory to incubate ourselves um, and to learn and really put into practice these new values of what types of organizations we want to work in. And so that's actually why one of the core values of WeShare today is permanent beta. And so for us, that really means this permanent process of agility and questioning and reacting to new, um, yeah, new developments, new ways the group is actually evolving. And so you can't really put your finger on what it is because it's actually always changing, and that's the main thing that defines it. And so um, in addition to, to WeShare, I've also been part of this other organization called Inspiral, which is a collective of social entrepreneurs based in New Zealand. And they've really been pioneering new forms of governance practices, but not only the practices, but also the tools. So what they're actually, what they've been doing is developing technology tools that make it easier for groups to collaborate together. And so that includes things like collaborative decision making, but also how groups can collaborate around finances. And so that actually brings me to my last point, which is the main thing that really has been intriguing me personally. So from doing this for the past five years, being in a lot of different communities and, and being, yeah, trying to organize these distributed groups, the topic that keeps popping up, which we talked about this morning, is value distribution, value measurement, and sort of the question of how can we distribute power if we're not distributing financial decision making? And so that's why actually that's the main thing that I'm currently trying to focus on and work on more which is developing tools that make it easier for groups to uh, make financial decisions together and actually bring more transparency and clarity into finances within different organizations. Because I think that's a really key point to enable, to create a more collaborative culture and, and distribute power, um, that we need to sort of look at that piece. So that's what I'm doing at the moment. And Marcos, we heard yesterday from you, I was really impressed with your presentation. I couldn't believe I was hearing a banker. Yes, with your tie. <laughs> uh, and I, I was told that for this session, you're interested in speaking uh, more on the overall concept of organizational, new developments in organizations that serve the common good and collaboration and possibly wearing your academic hat. So you can say whatever you want, but that's what I was told. I, I definitely will. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, thank you. I mean, I, I've been promised that I don't have to talk about banking, and that's the reason why it's so appealing to me. So for a while, I can just forget about banking and, you know, uh, speak about uh, different things that are very relevant for the life of, of the organization. And I would sort of uh, like to a little bit put on my... Uh, professor's hat and my academician hat and, you know, looking into organizational models and looking into what is important for an organization to become really value-driven, to be a different kind of animal, 
so an animal in which uh, it's not only about profits, but it's also about something else, about creating a better life for the communities, a better life for the co-workers, etc., etc. I mean, this is something that I've been working a little bit in the last years as a researcher and as an academician. And I would like to say something very specific, and it can be maybe part of the discussion. Uh, amongst others, I published a book in 2011 in Spanish. And the title of this book, for the ones who speak Spanish, and I, I know there are many in the audience, is uh, Por qué fracasan las organizaciones? In English, is why organizations fail. Uh, in that book, along with other researchers of the university, we went in detail into 50 cases of companies or other organizations, but mainly companies who have failed or who were just almost like you know, close to bankruptcy. And we really went in depth into the real reasons of why they fail. Why did they really fail? Because if you, if you read the Financial Times, or if you read the Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung or Expansion or other uh, economic papers and you see why Avengoa failed in Spain or why Call Bank in the UK is not doing that well, you always see and read things like, oh, they have a problem with the competition or they have a, a liquidity problem or they have whatever. And that's not true. Those are the symptoms and not the reasons why they failed. They, are, they were not the ultimate reasons. And what we did is we took 50 cases and we went in depth into what happened. So we interview supervisory board members, CEOs, the bankers who have lived and experienced what happened. We interview consultants who were around the company uh, in the process of failure. And at the end, we arrived to uh, very simple conclusions. In all the 50 cases, in all the 50 cases, the reasons for failure were either a bad governance system with not uh, enough countervailing powers, a bad organizational system, uh, not allowing people to say aloud what they thought about what happened in the company, or the second thing, um, lack of moral and ethical behavior in some key people. And those two reasons, governance and people, people means uh, misbehavior or whatever, they were present in all 50 cases. All 50 cases. You know, in some cases it was much more the governance, in others it was much more the people, in others it was a hybrid. But in all 50 cases you have this combination. And then the question obviously is, how can we make a company more resilient in terms of, of values, of really providing value to society um, while keeping it genuine? And normally the question is, you need to have the right people from a moral perspective, from an ethical perspective, not only from a technical perspective. You need to recruit the, the right people, to train the people the right way, and to keep it the right way. And then you need to have a very, very advanced governance model, really making sure that a CEO does not get crazy, because even the more brilliant CEO can get crazy. So that's a little bit the discussion I wanted to put. Great. Thanks. Thanks a lot. So um, looking at collaboration, you two have mentioned uh, mostly collaboration in ownership and in structure, structure and values. I would like to go back to Tess and ask you about your experience in collaboration with such a complex supply chain and what, what are some of the, the measures that, what are some of the challenges that you guys are bumping into and also some of the breakthroughs you're having? Yes, <laughs> where to start with challenges. Um, if you really look at all the different areas in which we're active, uh, sourcing conflict-free from vol volatile regions is, you know, a challenge in itself. So we work a lot with uh, a lot of different players. 
So for an example might be the conflict-free sourcing from the Congo. We worked with the Dutch government who acted as a broker and put together different uh, companies who were interested and showed demand for certain products while working with local governments to set up tagging and bagging, bagging and tagging systems and tracing these materials. So that's really a first step in which you really need to collaborate with different players. Another example is that we um, you know, we're a group of young people who are very ambitious and a lot of academic backgrounds in conflict studies or in labor issues, etc. But, you know, we're, we're, we're trying out. So we worked a lot with NGOs, for example, in working groups to think about, okay, so these are connected issues, low wages, long working hours. You know, you can't just, you know, shift some, some of these, uh, these buttons here and change the thing. You know, it's all a connected system. Let's work and let's try and get the academics and the NGOs and everyone together in working groups and to see how, in that sense, we can be a platform. So I think that that in itself is a challenge, but it is also a breakthrough because you ask organizations from their point of view to actually get out of their comfort zone as well to come up with solutions and not just to think about identifying what the problems are. And I think that that's been really uh, um, an amazing thing from Fairphone is that, you know, it is something that people can take into their companies and say, look, this is a Fairphone. What are we doing about it? You know, we're, this is a company that has brought together all the different disciplines in a company to, to come up with a solution. We can't just have the supply chain or the CSR department or the you know, marketing department thinking about these different things. It needs to be a collective uh, action. So those are maybe some examples. It's really very impressive. It's, it's, uh, that is just an incredible amount of moving parts. And I think it's going to be fascinating to watch how you guys develop. Moving targets that. is definitely a key phrase in our... <laughs> yeah, I would think our, uh, so. Yeah. I would think so. So, Francesca, um, you mentioned a little bit, you guys have an actual collaborative sort of joint working structure. I'd like to hear more about that. What kind of work are you doing? And, how, and, and if we're, t we're kind of questioning the assumption that collaboration is a basis of the new economy, how does that, how does that um, factor into various levels of the work that you're doing in one or both of the organizations? Here we've got some reverb. Uh, yeah, we've got some reverb. <laughs> Let's see, is that work? It's that one. They're hiding. Let's see. Okay. Yes. Seems all right. Um, yeah, so there's definitely many different levels to that, and um, it's something that's evolved over many years, so it's not something that just started working from the beginning, oh, let's work together collaboratively. Um, of course, there's, there's one level, which is technology tools that we use to help us, um, like take decisions on a, on a large scale. So um, as I mentioned, we have this tool called Lumio, which is for collaborative decision making, and so we have, um, we have sort of a governance structure that is centered around what we call WeShare connectors. So those are the, the most active nodes of our network. And they're sort of holding together all the, all the different communities. There's 80 of them. And so they have the most decision-making power around key questions around brand and finances. That's really the main two areas that we've identified that are reserved to connectors. And so on that tool, we can um, have discussions and then do consent-based decision-making, which is really great because um, Basically, it says that someone can disagree, but the, the decision can still pass. So it's really trying to go against that sort of typical um, stigma of groups that want collaborative decision making. They discuss for hours and hours and hours, and you know everything always has to be a full consensus. That's not at all what we've been doing. Um, and we actually use something called lazy consent, which means that people that don't want to engage in a decision, they don't have to and you don't need any type of majority. So what we've really been trying to navigate uh, with our, with our decision-making processes and governance is sort of having the right balance between enough structure and enough um, freedom for things to emerge and to also sort of uh, yeah, be, react really quickly like a startup in a way. And I think it's a really hard uh, in-between to find. Mm -hmm. And we've definitely gone through different, uh, different uh, yeah, moments where we had more structure and then we had less. But so the way I often like to actually describe it is that sort of we shares t a type of a chaos actually, and within it there's different projects, different things that are happening, and in them they're much more structured. And so the chaos is really what fuels the creativity and the development and the growth, 
and that's sort of the incubator part. And then within it, there are these teams. And so maybe to answer your question, what are some of the things we are actually doing? <laughs> um, so we started as a think tank. So a lot of the things we do are around knowledge production. So we have an online magazine where we publish a lot of different articles. We have many people that speak, that publish in other journalistic media. Uh, we also do different research projects. Mm -hmm. So we just released actually a study about new forms of governance. Um, we've also been doing different acceleration activities. So we had something called POC 21. Maybe some of you here have heard of it. It was a five-week accelerator that um, took place one hour outside of Paris in a castle where there were 12 projects that were trying to solve climate problems with open source products. Um, and so then we also do a lot of events. So what we really like doing is bringing together people with different perspectives and helping them connect and also create empathy among each other to do things together. So convening is really something also that I enjoy a lot. Great, thank you. I'm a, as I hear you speak, I'm remembering a term I heard. There's a book called The Birth of the Chaotic Age and it talks about how everything is chaos and then there will be these little eruptions of order you know, that kind of stem out of that, but you have to have some of that chaos in order to have maximum creativity. I think it's really, really um, impressive what you guys are doing. And then, Marcus, for you, um, again, wearing your professor hat, I'd be curious to know what you had to say about different ways of collaborating in and between academia and perhaps the silos that sometimes occur within academia. I know in this room there are institutions that are great examples of a different way, but just your thoughts there and how um, how different ways of collaborating in academia could help accelerate a move to a new economy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. When I was listening to you, to you both, uh, I was immediately thinking on uh, well, the, the persons that you were working uh, that, that are working in your organizations. I mean, probably none of them, or only a few of them, have been trained uh, to work that way. Because, I mean, they all come from the normal universities and normal business school and, well, you know, I mean, they have been trained just the old way. But, of course, I mean, when they, I'm sure when they joined the organization, it was like, wow, this is great. But they need some, you know, adjustment to this new sort of decision-making process that you mentioned or to look into the, you know, supplier's value chain in a different way. And, and yeah, that's a challenge for academic institutions. Uh, and it's a challenge that uh, I think that uh, I would say we, from an academic perspective, we academic institutions, we need to face this challenge. Uh, we need to change the way in which we are training people in the management, business schools, economy schools. And I think that we all here, the GABB has a, a program with some universities to help them use our banks as example of the values-based approach to help business cases to understand the way, the new way of understanding the economy, et cetera, et cetera. We need to do it. We need to push the universities into that. Um, because you know what happens today when uh, the dean of a business school is asked by anyone saying, hey, dean, um, what are you doing to promote a new economy? What are you doing to promote, you know, leaders which, has, which have, you know, uh, more genuine values? And they will normally say, oh, we're doing lots of things, you know? Uh, for instance, we, are, we have created a new core, core course in ethics in finance or in, you know, ethics in management. Which means, at the end, that they have had, they have, they have had 20 hours of a course in ethics the rest of the curriculum remains exactly the same. Is this what we need to do? No! We need to rethink the way we are teaching management. We need to take the core course of corporate finance, that's my major, or the core course of strategic marketing and reshape it. What does it mean a strategic marketing from an ethical perspective? What does, it, what does it mean corporate finance in a company that is putting people and the planet on the top of the pyramid? How can we interpret again what 
leverage and equity means. It's not just finance. So we need to make this effort, and it's possible. But we need a cooperation between universities that want to make this change, and companies like ours that are involved in this change. But we need to do it. We will not solve the problem just adding a core course in ethics. Yeah, I so appreciate those comments. I've heard it said, I can't remember who said it, but um, if you ask the wrong question, the answers don't matter. And having just come through the US presidential election, um, I can tell you we were not asking the right questions. That's for, that's for certain. So I, I think keying in on some of those questions and, and being willing to ask questions that make us uncomfortable. Because otherwise, we're asking questions that keep us attached to the very, the very systems that we're trying to shift. So to any of you, but to you two especially, as social entrepreneurs who are, you're basically doing what Einstein warns us not to do, which is trying to solve problems within the, you know, with a thinking that, that, that created them in the first place, because you're existing within this system that we're trying to shift, and really doing some radically different things. And if you could wave a wand and, and, and just make a few leveraged pressure point shifts that would that would ease the, the innovations that you're trying to create, what might those be? <laughs> I was still thinking about the answer with the academics, actually. <laughs> um, you can because I think, I, I, I think it's good to say we are about system change. So mm -hmm. it's, it is, it is, you can change the system. You know, it'll have to be all the players, whether it's the government, the civil society, public society. You know, businesses all need to kind of start thinking differently, but somewhere you need to start, and we decided to do it as a business. Um, and I think it is that disruption. I was thinking about the, in terms of like, what can we teach people at schools is that we work a lot with um, university students who come, obviously, we have a really young uh, group of employees who, or a group of people who work, are working with us and they have their skills that they take with them. But I think that the big thing is, this, is what I hear a lot here is from the heart. Mm -hmm. And I think that when you talk about academia and science, you know, it's all rethinking stuff. So if there's anything that you can learn is that if you're in the business, we need those Excel sheets, you know, and we need those PowerPoints and we need the skills that everybody has. But I think what they're not learning is how to trust yourself to make those decisions and to actually see how, if you want to go somewhere, you're not going to get somebody else to teach you what the path is. You know, you're going to have to make that decision yourself. So I think that there is like a really important connection between universities with skills that you learn, but also with reality, because right now, reality is shifting. So how can we kind of collect and, and have both of these e equally present, so that would be my input. So am I hearing you correctly that you're saying, sort of from, a, from an employer's perspective, needing people that can, that can do the, the spreadsheets and the technical stuff, but also have this capacity for more creative yes. thinking in the trust, yeah. so that if the academic institutions could develop more of that kind of, of the soft skill and the thinking, that would really help your social enterprise. Yes. Interesting. It's, it's design thinking, it's iterating, you know? It's saying mm -hmm. that right now we don't have the final answer yet, but if we keep on going, that creativity is something that's definitely helped us. So, so uh, part of that being the ability to work with what's uncertain and changing, but stay basically going in the same direction. Yeah, that's a challenging skill. Yeah, and I think I like your... your, uh, your thing about asking the wrong questions. I mean, I think designers can design anything, you know? If you want to design a, a TV that you can look at, but if you want to design something that actually lasts for 20 years yeah. instead of 10 years, you're going to have to ask, give them a different assignment. So it's also about shifting your, 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 your questions and your assignments. For sure, thanks. Yeah, I wanted to add something to that point, actually. Um, so about taking people out of their comfort zone and building trust to make that possible. Because um, I've been thinking a lot about that, and it's clear that if we want this transformation to happen, it's going to be pretty uncomfortable. And so that's why um, I think what, what really has been helping and why I think more of these collectives are emerging, like WeShare and Inspiral and many of the other organizations here, 
is that they're sort of creating safe spaces and they're building really strong groups of high trust that are making it easier to make that step. Because I think it's clear that we, we need to make that. It's going to be uncomfortable. So it's better if we've created networks and strong communities of people to support us in doing that and to make us feel less isolated and alone in doing it. And actually, it makes me think of um, an interesting image that Charles Eisenstein, um, maybe some of you have heard of him. He's a very uh, iconic writer and uh, thinker on uh, the future stories that we need to tell um, about the society we want to live in. And so um, he sort of painted this image of you have the clouds and there's people that are sort of jumping and like looking above the clouds to try to see, you know, um, the future world that could be there. And that um, at the beginning, or like maybe you know, a few years ago, there were not many people when you like peeked your head up. <laughs> but there's more and more now when you look above. Oh, there's a couple others. There's more of us. Yeah. So um, that makes it easier to be to be looking beyond like that and um, to to really make those uncomfortable steps. Yeah, definitely. I think I I am a little longer in the tooth in this movement maybe than you guys are. And I this is probably the most energized new economy event I've ever been at and it is super super exciting and I I am just you know very quickly in the life cycle of caterpillars when a caterpillar goes into the cocoon its body starts to break down and at some point these things called imaginal cells pop out and at first, the immune system, that status quo immune system, attacks them as intruders. And then, over time, the imaginal cells continue to develop, and there's this magical moment where all of a sudden they kind of recognize one another and realize that they're actually now a butterfly. And I think that we are all imaginal cells in what feels a little like creative destruction, but has definitely gained a lot of momentum just in the last couple of years. So, yeah. Curls, do you have anything that you'd like to, or Marcos, that you'd like to add along the lines of turning out on, uh, entrepreneurs and people who are really able to think creatively and maintain their footing in these nebulous, changing times? That coming out of our academic institutions? Well, yeah. Uh, just a reflection about um, uh, people in general, yeah. I mentioned at the beginning that uh, in that book that I wrote some years ago, uh, the, big, the two big problems of the companies who fail were either governance or, well, people who were not uh, uh, doing the right things. And, and just, just sticking to that, to people, I mean, if we are all promoting together a, a new economy, we just read the Malaga Charter uh, yesterday here together, and we were saying things like a more democratic economy, uh, empowering people, et cetera, et cetera. And you, your organizations, you are sort of, and also some of our banks are also doing those kind of things, trying to empower people, trying to sort of having people that are decision maker, makers at every single level of the organization. Um, but again, uh, be careful with that. Hmm. <clears throat> it's, it's nice to have a democratic uh, economic system whenever you have really educated people to serve in those, uh, between those waves. Because otherwise it can be really dangerous. So again, let me stress the incredible importance of shifting and connecting with, uh, with the world of academia. We need to rethink the way in which we train our people. They have to be ready to make those decisions in your, in your side. They need to recognize the uh, consequences of those decisions, whether they are right or wrong. And I'm afraid, that, I'm afraid that our system today, our academic system, is not ready for that yet. So we have to pay a lot of attention to the way we recruit people to make sure that we have people that can do it that way. Uh, because it will take a little bit longer to change the academic system. So that's my only reflection about that. So I'm curious if you two have any comments on that as um, these innovative governance and, and value distribution structures that you're working with, are you running into, have you had challenges where you've been too democratic with your, with your um, 
decision making or what have you or not. I'd just love to get your take on that. Do I go first? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so of course it's not, it's been very challenging to, to implement these systems, especially because people aren't used to it and it takes a long time to sort of shift the culture around that. Um, I would say the problem is not too democratic, because um, as I said, it's consent based, so actually things move pretty quickly and people that want to be engaged can. But that's actually where the challenge is. Um, it's sort of about volume of information and understanding the information and filtering it. So um, generally, any network I know that is, has a lot of different uh, organizations has a real issue around knowledge and getting access to information in a way that you can actually make a decision. So um, what tends to happen is that people that have the time and resources end up in stronger positions of power because they can invest the effort needed to understand everything and then shape decisions. And so others that don't, can't really participate because it demands a specific amount of time. And so therefore you sort of have these inequalities that get created pretty easily. Mm -hmm. um, and so, of course, there's also other questions around the medium. So online versus offline. Um, there's advantages to both. Um, the online really helps surface voices that sometimes wouldn't actually come out in a live meeting because some people are more shy. On the other hand, you have the same thing if everything is just online. So inclusion is definitely a big, uh, big topic around that. But so that's actually why I'm sort of quite intrigued and fascinated around technology tools that can help us really like condense and simplify information to make it super easy for someone to come and just understand, oh, that's the finances, okay, here I can get a big overview of the, the picture and then make a decision. So to me, that's really a nut we need to crack, and I don't know how exactly mm. it's gonna work. It's but it's something about being able to yeah, filter the volume of information there is and understand what is relevant. Because um, also in all of the networks I'm part of, there's people that fill a specific role that I would count myself to, who can filter loads and loads of information without getting really, really tired and confused, and can sort of pick out like where to focus their, their attention. And so those people, they're really key in these kind of networks, they always pop up, and they're sort of helping others understand but it's a really messy process that can't actually be described at all. Um, and so maybe there's ways to make that actually, yeah, more accessible or convert that into a tool that could help do that. You know, I'm hearing you speak and I, I have to question if I'm stuck in my own perception, my own comfort zone, because I hear that and I think, but a lot of these processes are complex and some of it can't be simplified down to make it that quick and then and then but then as soon as you accept that you're also accepting that there are going to be fewer number of people who will be making key decisions and that is a really difficult balance point well and i think that that is where education i do hope will um, have a have a role to play in the sense of creating more people that can manage a higher level of complexity mm -hmm. i would hope that we can manage to, to mm -hmm. produce more people like that, let's say. Um, but for now, yeah, that's definitely an automatic filter that sort of reduces who participates. Yeah. Yeah, I think I've got uh, like on three layers. Um, so back to the other question of where I would like to wave my magic yes. wand <laughs> is um, got one question behind here every time. No, but I think it's uh, I think there are three things. One is the shareholder structure in combination with finance, which just has a power in companies that I think is something that we need to reconsider. Um, who has the ownership of companies and how does that impact decisions? Where is the value? How do we redefine what value is and how it's for everybody? I think the other thing is organization and governance. Uh, governance is incredibly important, and we've also experienced that in the past year. Um, you said a CEO that goes crazy, but a lot of startups depend on their CEO as figureheads. So what happens when he disappears, you know? Mm -hmm. So how resilient is a company? And we worked with models like holacracy, which is, it's not anti-hierarchical, but it's more about responsibility. So everybody is hired because they know the most about that particular field to make the most informed decisions, and that's their responsibility. So how do you work in circles and in teams? And that's something that really takes work and that you need to work on every day, and we didn't succeed to keep it going. But 
I think that we really need different forms of organizations, whether it's cooperatives, membership organizations, employee cooperatives. I think there's so much differentiation that we can still have in that sense, rather than the shareholder-owned kind of line diagram <laughs> organizations that we have. Um, because I think when I look at, you know, information used to be power, right? You know, those people who had information, they are the ones who had power. And with all our communication tools these days, Sometimes I get messages in on my computer and I just I can't remember which tool it was that sent me. Yeah. Was it Twitter? Was it Slack? Was it uh, Google Drive? Was it, you know? But these younger people that I work with, they just, they, they, they're, they live in this, this interconnected world where these tools just give them different kinds of information and they know how to disseminate information into the right different tools. So I think that that is sped up so fast in the past 10 years, I can imagine that universities haven't been able to keep up with just all the information sharing tools that we have. So, yeah, I mean, where do you learn faster in an organization or at a university when it comes to those things? So I think those are the key things, is really trust the young people with information sharing, look at organization structures and look at that stru ownership structure, I think is really, uh, needs change. Yeah, that's really insightful, and I really appreciate your honesty, and if you don't mind pushing, my, my pushing it a step further, why didn't you succeed in implementing the, the system you were trying to there, the more collaborative system? I think it was just the, the speed in which we were growing, mm -hmm. and we, uh, we, I think we worked like that quite intuitively already. What Holacracy does is it separates strategy from governance, from operations. So in a startup, you'll have a meeting where it goes, okay, so we need to do this, okay. But why are we doing that? Oh, and, and who's doing that? You know, and then you get these three different questions which are like, it stops any meeting. So if you separate, like operationally, I need you to do my next task, and why we're doing that, I'm gonna park that for a kind of governance meeting and, or a strategy meeting, and who's doing that would be someone else to think about these things. So it's a really interesting uh, approach to working together. But we had a lot of people coming in, especially uh, new managers, and just to keep on educating people was just a, it was a, it, it's a daily mm -hmm. thing that you need to do, and we just lagged behind. And it doesn't mean that we won't try again sometime in the future, but it was really insightful to really focus on the internal organization. Capacity challenges yes. are big for almost any yes. startup, <laughs> let alone one that's as innovative as you guys are. Um, e either of you have anything Well, to actually, add? just to add to that, um, it's something that I've encountered quite often, which is shifting to a model like that takes a lot of extra time and energy, and yeah. often it's hard to prioritize that in the short term sure. and somehow convince people that it's worth that yeah. extra work. Because it definitely takes a while, but I think once you have it working, then, then it's a lot easier. And so that's actually this other project I'm in. We were experimenting with people um, setting their own salaries, basically, or agreeing within their sub-team how much money they get. And it took a huge amount of effort. And it's just, yeah, it's really, really slow. But um, if that, it needs to be one of the core aims, I think, of actually what you're doing. You need to sort of talk about the fact that the how is maybe just as important as the what. And I think then maybe that helps put more resources aside for that. It strikes me that in our movement, uh, one of the things that will be helpful is really, really, as best we can, um, almost developing case studies of innovations like these. And it's especially helpful, I think, to hear what doesn't, what hasn't worked, what you've tried and hasn't worked. So maybe you can just check that off the list as a new one and go on to the next. But um, it's, a, it's a lot of heavy lifting, and I really respect what you guys are doing. It's really, really important pioneering. So, I don't know how much time, one, two, so two minutes. Um, very quickly, and I'm kind of picking on you, and I'm sorry about that, but sorry. one of my pet peeves is externalized costs. And you're really in a field where you're, you're um, disadvantaged by externalized costs. And I'd love to hear a little bit about, you have this longer life cycle product, it's not planned obsolescence, how have you been capturing the value of the reduced externalized cost in your product and in your model? And just so I understand what you define as an externalized costs? Uh, like we're not, we're not, when we buy that throwaway phone, we're not paying for the downstream effects of the okay. pollution and the waste, and, yeah. or even the, the effects of the toxics on the people producing it, but the system obviously pays for those. Yeah. 
So one of the uh, images that you saw was we did a, we've used our phone to do a life cycle assessment, but also to do a recyclability study. And it's hard to benchmark these studies, yeah. except on your own products. So, you know, time will tell whether we've actually managed to impact. But one of the studies, for example, was if we uh, keep this phone for five years and you assume that you would need a new screen or a new mm -hmm. bottom module or whatever, then you need to take into account that these need to be produced and in that sense, what the CO2 emissions would be. And it, it turned out that actually modularity, I'm saying it wrong, that was a life cycle assessment. Modularity does reduce the CO2 impact mm -hmm. um, if people maintain and keep their phones uh, uh, for a longer period of time. So uh, that helped. Also recycling, if you make things more modular, it is easier mm -hmm. to take them apart. Yeah. It, it is easier to take out the different materials. It's still shocking that only less than 40% of this phone could be recycled and reused. So it serves as input to like look at the next design, how Absolutely. we could make more certain parts more modular. Um, and it doesn't mean that modular is the answer to everything. It's, just a, it's an approach that we took, and we've been trying to, not in retrospect, <laughs> prove, but it is, it is showing that it, it does have an, an impact if we can, we, can, we can service it for five years and people make sure that the phone is being used for five years, then it definitely reduces uh, environmental impact. Yeah, it's going to be a, a really important step, I think. So we're down to probably just a minute, and maybe just round robin, um, super, super, super quick, any thoughts that you guys might have, or just insights, or anything you'd want to say about collaboration as basis of a new economy? Nope, oh, she's going to go. Go, go ahead. <laughs> well, I would just say, um, keep going. <laughs> Persistence always pays off. Um, you were saying uh, what makes a success, right? It's uh, about the good governance and communication. And so I think it's amazing that we have events like this and we should have more of them. And um, I think especially try to engage with people that are very different from us and try to understand what drives them and build those bridges. Because I think the bubbles we're in are one of the biggest challenges. Agreed. We keep running into the same people that share the same ideas, which is great, but we need to try to meet more that don't and convince them. Yeah, Good. I yeah. agree with that. <coughs> well, I, yeah. I would say keep going also, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and ju just a final reflection also, um, um, and I was thinking in, in the, and the open question about ownership that you mentioned earlier. And, and ownership is really key also. And I think we, uh, we have to really focus, I mean, all together in, in, in trying to educate owners and shareholders. Because, I mean, uh, a mainstream shareholder today is a, share, a shareholder who decides whether uh, he or she will invest in this or that company looking into three things, which is profitability, risk and liquidity okay that's the three things the gold triangle it's called in the you know finance world um, we need a different kind of owner and different kind of shareholder who to those three things because those three things are still true add a fourth a four things which is uh, in the pyramid it has to be on the top it's impact impact and people so whenever we have shareholders who understand that impact and people, profitability, risk and liquidity, are the things that they have to look at, we will have a different kind of owner and probably an owner that, under, that will understand that he is not the owner of the company, but it's part of the uh, holistic ownership formed by many stakeholders. Or she's not the owner of the company. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you guys very much. It was fantastic. <laughs>